Are you about ready to get started? I did bring a bunch of stickers with me for the projects I'll talk about. They're, I just put them on the edge of the stage there. You can grab those on the way out. That's assuming you like what I say. Maybe you won't. But could someone grab the door for us? Go and close up. That'll tell everyone else they should be in here. <laughs> all right, let's get started. I'm going to actually start with a demonstration, all right, to kind of give you guys a perspective on what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the session. Because the key thing to take away from the session is that to get into the re reactive programming model, you have to rewire your wetware. You have to rewire your brain. Because you can't think in terms of create, read, update, delete. There's still crud in this world, and I appreciate we love our crud as developers, right? Java developers, enterprise developers, we love crud. We've been doing create, read, update, delete for years. We call that crud, and that's the way we live. You know, get, put, post, delete, right? We love our get and post. We do some put every now and then, rarely, and we may do some delete every now and then. But this is different, okay? You can still do those same things, those old school, 20-year-old things, or this is the new school. And so in a reactive programming world, the one thing you gotta keep in mind is you can no longer know and bind a thread to every single request. There's no thread per request in this world. There's a thread, a single thread, to handle everybody. Okay, you're probably thinking, how is that even possible? Well, we're gonna talk about that. This particular presentation, this demonstration, is to make that point. I have simply two sensors right now running. You can see they just started running right before, you know, right before you guys got here. Already one has produced 1,037 messages, another one has produced 998 messages. They're producing a message about every half second or so. They're producing messages with two sensors, streaming it in from this little sensor over here on my right and this one here on the left. And uh, here, I'll just show it to you real quick. And actually, let's see if we, if we can... I have to be a little cautious of it, because uh, I took the casing off of it. And you can see, just by my touching it, it already has changed the temperature reading of this one. Okay, so this is the actual... I'm SSH into the sensor here, grabbing the sensor data. It's streaming in through MQTT here into Vertex, the Vertex project. And the, it's then sending that out to a graph on the browser. And now, if I cover it up a little bit more, see, there goes the temperature spikes way up. Uh, and if I let it go, we can spike it up. Okay, so the re nice thing about that is this is just super sensitive, it's easy to see. This is a TI sensor tag, it costs $29, it has 10 different sensors built into it. Uh, so this is, I'm using the IR temperature, there's also ambient temperature, barometer, accelerometer, gyroscope, luxometer, light reading. So it's just a real nice way to drive high volume transactions into the, into the system. It's actually a Bluetooth based sensor, and a little, it has a little tiny watch battery on the back. And then I'm using this guy, all right, this is the thing I'm SSH'd into right here. This is an Intel Edison. The Intel Edison is this green part, and that, so it's kind of hard to describe, and you guys are probably thinking, you can't even see what I'm holding up. So think post-it stamp, and you got the right mindset, okay? The thing on the back, the thing that makes it so thick is the battery. The, the CPU, the Wi-Fi radio, the, uh, and Bluetooth radio are really mm, post-it stamp. Okay, Intel Edison. And so basically what I'm doing is I've SSH'd into that little Linux machine. This is a full Linux server, by the way. All right. I'm, I'm running Linux. I'm running a Node.js process that connects via Bluetooth to my sensor. And then I, it's grabbing temperature. You can see there it goes shooting up again. And then it's pulling that into over my Wi-Fi router. I bring my own Wi-Fi router to the laptop. And then I graph it. Okay. Uh, and so here's my other sensor, the bottom sensor there. We can spike it up. There it goes. All right, so that's this one right here. So I can make its temperature shoot way up. There I go. So just based on the heat of my hand. All right, so it's nice and sensitive. But the whole point of this, if you're thinking in a thread per request world, if you're thinking in CRUD, create, you know, create, read, update, delete, if you think in get, put, post, delete, you can't quite get there from here. This is a message-driven system, an event-driven system, and I'm, drive, I'm now over 2,200 messages into the system in the few minutes we've been together. So you can't keep up with the volume. In one specific case, I saw an organization that had a hundred, uh, sorry, a million smart meters. So a million of these things. Therefore, you're getting over a million transactions per second into your system. So you have to start thinking in that kind of scale. So this is not an IoT session. The point of that was just to talk about reactive programming. The code to this is super simple. You can kind of see that basically it receives messages, and then it turns around and publishes the message as a JSON object. Uh, in this case, you can see it's basically incrementing a counter. The majority of the logic here is incrementing a counter, the counter you see down here at 1,200, 1,100 something. And then um, it actually does a publish. That publish is, is on the browser side, all right? Uh, and we're going to talk more about this, but basically 
the browser is a peer of the server-side architecture, which is connected to this architecture via this router. Okay, I know that's kind of hard to describe, but there's not a lot of code here, but it is a new way of thinking. Is this fair? Does this kind of help set the uh, context correctly? So, okay, I, I appreciate you might not be in sensors, but this is how, if you're doing industrial monitoring, temperature and vibration, the accelerometer, the two key indicators to system failure, right? If you have a big industrial fan the size of the screen over here that keeps your plant uh, from having poisonous gases inside it, right? If that fan goes down, or better yet, if it gets wobbly and it's about to go down and you don't maintain it properly, you have to send everyone home for the day. They can't work in a, in a, in a place where they might have poisonous gases, as an example. So it's important that you monitor your fan. Okay, it's super critical, actually. So simple things like that. Now, again, to give you a little more context here, before we really get into the presentation, using the same Bluetooth idea, and in my case, we use Raspberry Pis instead of this Intel Edison. They all work the same way. It's all Linux. But basically, I can actually triangulate the location of things, too. Now, in the case of an industrial setting, your fan doesn't move too often. In a hospital setting, the hospital equipment moves up and down the hospital floors, bedroom, all over the place. Often, you know, the ultrasound just got lost. It's somewhere in some patient's room. We can't remember where the emergency was. So simple things like tool tracking is super critical, also a super critical use case. Same kind of architecture. And so to prove that point, a couple years ago, we gave away 300 Bluetooth beacons. We handed them to conference attendees just like yourselves. Uh, and we said, OK, go just run around our conference. Do whatever you want to do. And we wanted to see what they did. So this is a single day activity. You can see it starts about 8 o'clock in the morning with people showing up on this, this little room here. It was actually on a different floor entirely. And that's breakfast, right? So they're all coming to breakfast and they're hanging out with each other and networking. And then at some point you see them all blast down here because that's our breakouts. Just like you guys just came in here right now from the keynote room, right? You're now in the breakout session. And we watch you go through the breakout sessions back and forth throughout the day. And by the way, I, I sped this up, but this is all done in real time. You could actually watch yourself walking on the map, OK? Um, and then later in the afternoon, we basically have a keynote specifically. And you'll see everyone kind of shooting over here about 1,600. There they go. All right? And here's the part that kind of, I'll just pause that for a second. We then got a chance to tell everybody, as they saw this thing up on the big screen, we just walked you walk into this room. Every ball was uniquely identifiable. You could click on it, but I have the person's name. Uh, and we could track all your whereabouts throughout the day with a handful of Raspberry Pis and a Bluetooth sensor like this one. The full kit cost us $3,000 because I had to buy a lot of it. So 7 million transactions into our system, right? And then, of course, we processed it through Apache Spark to do the triangulation. Are you closer to here, closer to there? Then we basically finished our keynote. And then you'll notice as the day goes on, you know, we're now at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, people were leaving the building. By 10 o'clock at night, when I got back to my hotel room to take this video after this presentation, you know, you can see most people are, have left the building at that point. Okay? So, again, different mindset. You guys cool with that? Different way of thinking. Now, you guys are probably thinking, we did this already. Like, if I went to Sweden, they're like, we do all this already. You know, maybe, I don't know if you guys do all this stuff here in Luxembourg. Anyone do this sort of IoT kind of thing in Luxembourg? No one brave enough to raise your hand? That's okay. All right, let's jump back in. I'm going to switch now back to the main Wi-Fi. And there is no password. <laughs> uh, but there wasn't a moment ago. <laughs> oh, wait, I clicked on the, I have to click on the free one, sorry. All right, let's see if it'll connect. Now, let's dive into this. We don't, we've already spent way too much time on that one topic. The presentation, for those of you guys paying attention, is at Bitly Reactive MSA. So that's where all the slides are. You get access to the source code to the slides. You then can run away with it and do with it as you will. It's all a Google Doc, just as you see here. Also, there's a lot of links inside this document that you'll want to follow up on for all the different demos, including that demo if that's the one you want. All right, so let's get into it. There's a document that you can actually download to get your head wrapped around Vertex super easily. It's at developers.reddit.com. It's a free ebook we wrote with O'Reilly. Download it, get started on a microservices architecture and a, re a reactive microservices architecture, which is kind of what we're focused on. Now, I always like putting things in perspective. From a developer perspective in the 70s, if you're a programmer in the 70s, you really didn't have to know a whole lot of technologies. You had to know COBOL, pretty much. There were other te technologies, but COBOL was a traditional enterprise developer, and either JCL or WIFL. So two of the three you had to know. JCL if you're an IBMer, right? IBM mainframer, or WIFL if you were specifically a Unisys Sperry 
person, which I was more of a Wiffle person. So, and you're probably thinking, what the hell's a Unisys or Sperry? I appreciate that. At least IBM's still around. Now, in the 80s, it got really complicated. We might have picked up C, C++. We might have picked up all the different 4GL technologies of the day. We may have learned CASE, computer-aided software engineering. That's where we drew pictures to generate COBOL code. Anybody remember those errors that day? No? Okay. Netware. I was a netware administrator. And some of you are thinking, what the hell's a netware? Exactly. You remember netware, banyan vines? I appreciate that you might not anymore. But this was the era in which relational databases were born, and they're still with us. So SQL and relational databases are still around. Unfortunately, Unix is kind of gone at this point, too. So <laughs> what's funny is a lot of these things have either stayed or gone. Uh, and the 90s, it got a little more complicated. We had to learn HTTP. We had to learn HTML. We had to learn CGI. There was actually a great book, by the way. You could learn HTML in three days by Lauren LeMay. Uh, now it takes a lot longer than three days to learn that, if you think about it. You know, there was no CSS back then. There was no JavaScript back then. But we would learn get and post. We, would learn, we actually had to talk to people about what a cookie was. Because at the time, in 1996, people were super afraid of cookies. They actually thought they were going to steal your credit cards. And so programmers would not use cookies in their applications because it would steal their credit cards. It was kind of a strange moment in time, okay? But this also was when Java was born, servlets were born, Windows NT, and I know I'm in the NT room, so we're in the Windows NT room, excellent. Um, but it was really, this is probably more the era you guys were involved with, right? So in the OOs, we learned things like MVC and struts, we would struts, dependency injection with Spring, ORM with Hibernate. This is the era in which JBoss really came into its full, full form as an example. We, we also picked up HTML and web services. My point with this is, the learning curve you have to go through just continues to grow, okay? Reactive is just yet one more new thing I'm asking you to learn. And I'm hoping you guys, after the session, go, okay, I'm willing to learn that. I'm willing to invest my time in that particular category. And if you do all these things, obviously, you're, the, you're a unicorn, like the GitHub unicorn. All right, let's keep going. So reactive. React, there's two types of reactive. It's highly, it's, well, there's many types of reactive, if you will. There's, it's an overloaded term. A lot of people focus on just the reactive programming side. So reactive programming using something like Rx Java or using something like Project Reactor, it's all about the programming model. Okay, focus on the code. There's also reactive systems. And reactive systems can be done with or without reactive programming. I know that, that might blow your mind, but a reactive system has its own definition. And we want to focus more on reactive systems and reactive infrastructure because that is where you actually get the uh, more bang for the buck, if you will, from an enterprise standpoint, from a mission-critical system standpoint. So you can use Redux, which is the Eclipse Redux project in any of these cases. This is the reactive manifesto. There's the URL at the bottom. You can go look at it yourself, but the whole, the, the, it has some basic core tenets. It has to be message-driven. A reactive system should be message-driven, not request-response-driven, not get put post-driven, right? Not CRUD, if you will, but message-driven, which is why I showed you that first presentation of streaming sensor data, okay? The, also, it has to be responsive. I'll show you a demonstration of responsive. It has to be responsive. What does a user do to your application when it's not responsive? You know, you're, you, most of you guys probably build web applications. How many people do web applications of some sort? There's an HTML client, okay? Only about half of you. The other half do green screen, right? Batch, probably some batch folks here or 5250, 3270s folks, that's cool. But um, in the case of web applications, what happens if the user does not get a response? What do you do as a user when you use the web and the response is too slow? You hit refresh, because that helps the programmer, right? <laughs> it makes the program run faster. Refresh, refresh, refresh. Every refresh is a brand net new transaction with all the previous ones no longer having a person to respond to. So if five users all hit refresh five times, you know how tw you have 20 different requests that don't need responses, okay? So being responsive is super important because the user does not like waiting. And you have to be responsive in the face of overwhelming load, elasticity, and you need to be responsive in the face of overwhelming failure, resiliency. So responsiveness is the key, all right? And so how do you do that in a thread-blocking world? It's much harder in a thread-blocking world. In a non-blocking async world, it's much easier. The question has always been, how hard is that code to write? And it's been relatively difficult until we have something like, you know, Akka or Vertex as an example. So let's actually show you that. This is a demonstration. Again, I mentioned I have links all throughout the presentation. You can see several people have joined me. These are you guys probably here. Okay. Uh, let's go look at this real quickly. Okay. So there's my client. Uh, what I'm going to do is I have a couple services that I'm going to run. Okay. Uh, just simple localhost services. And actually, let me go... Shut this guy down over here because he's sitting on my port. Let me bring up Spring Boot. So just, this is Spring Boot on Tomcat, traditional 
you know, enterprise Java style application with Spring MVC controller, and it basically has a nice little URL on it. Let's just go hit it, our local host, 80, and there we go. Okay, so there's my, there's my hitting of the URL. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Move it over here. We got a lot of things to show you. This is one problem with screen resizes. Not that one, we don't care about that one any longer. All right, right here, there. Okay, here's what's happening. I've already lost my screen again, come back. And there we go. Okay, so here we go. I'm, I'm basically just, I'm hitting refresh, refresh, refresh. I'm getting a response, pretty straightforward stuff. It's just a get request, give me that response, okay? Hello from Spring Boot. Now, what happens is I'm gonna jam in 200 concurrent requests into the system. You can see they're getting queued up there. And now look what happens. My responsiveness has died. I'm now locked up entirely. My user is stuck. Because if you have 200 requests and only 100 threads, somebody has to wait. Okay? This is just the very nature of this architecture. It has always been this way, and it continues to be this way. If you have 200 requests and 100 threads, 100 people are going to wait. And so in this case, the browser is waiting. You see it does eventually respond based on a thread becoming available to service my request. Pretty standard stuff. And now that basically I've gone through all 200 requests, I'm back to good again. Now you might be thinking, I'm picking on poor Tomcat, right? I'm not. I'm, let's run this on JBoss, okay? The Wildfly application server. It works the same way because this is the very nature of Java EE, right? It's a thread per request. So if I go in there and now run this guy, let's see, there we go. Now he's running, and I throw 200 requests at him, and we come in here, and here we go. Uh, there. All right, you can see it's stuck again. I'm no longer getting a response because all 100 threads are now you know, being hit with 200 requests. This thing doesn't do anything more than actually calculate pi. It just has a bit of business logic that does a lot of computation, and it takes time okay, to calculate pi. And, um, and there we go. All right, so now we're back to good again. Now, the difference in this, new, this world, ah, go away. I closed it before all the connections were out, all right? The difference in this world is if I run Vertex now, Vertex is a single-threaded model, okay? So it's up, it, notice how fast it starts, it's also way smaller than the rest, it's a single thread. And the cool thing about that is, if you throw 200 requests at a single thread, it's always responsive. And you're probably thinking, how, what, a single thread? Always responsive with 200 concurrent requests? Yes, because it's always done async, okay? So, yes, I have a single thread now running 200 concurrent requests, and the user still sees a response. Completely different way of thinking about the problem, okay? And the programming model, let me show you the programming model, because this is what normally people worry about. They're like, well, I can't write that code. I appreciate that the code might look a little strange to you, but let's look at it real quick. All right, let's go look at our, let's look at our Spring Boot application. So right here, it is just a request method get, right? It's a server controller. It says goodbye. This is the one that actually has the computation in it. So this is the business logic right here. This is all my business logic. And this, and this is the URL it maps to, and this is the get request. So pretty standard if you're familiar with Spring. Here's the Java E version. Looks almost identical, right? But Jax RS has a different set of annotations. It has a get and a path and produces. And okay, and there's the goodbye and there's the nap. Okay, but identical business logic. Here's the Vertex version of this. Here is the business logic. Looks identical, pretty much the same, it's the same business logic. The difference is how you set up the routes to it. And if you're familiar with Node.js at all, I'll make this a little bit bigger, all right, you can see you're basically binding a handler to a specific URL because that handler binding is do it async. Do it asynchronously, do not block the user thread, basically push it off to a background thread, one you don't care about, and then get the response back to that user asynchronously. It, so the point of this is you do set it up differently, but the business logic's still the same. Is that cool? Okay, so if you can get your head around the basic concepts I've showed you so far, you kind of have the reactive principles starting to map into your brain a little bit. Uh, and then we'll, we'll keep diving in here, though. We've got a lot more cool things to show you, and we only have 32 minutes left. Uh, where is that window now? Oh, this window. Okay, let's go back here. Uh, did I leave that guy running? Let's go ahead and turn him off. Not that one. And here. All right. Okay, we'll just jump back in here. Present. All right, we're going to rock and roll through these slides because there's a bunch of other cool demos I want to show you. I have a ton of code, but that's just the one that kind of sets the point of a threaded model, thread per request model versus thread per core model, right? Async versus sync world. Now, if you want to do microservices, which everybody wants to do, it seems like everybody's doing it, right? We're all talking about it. We're doing it. I'm do you doing it? I'm doing it, okay? 
This is a part by Martin Fowler. If you're going to do it, for real, you need to kind of be this tall. You guys might not appreciate the expression, but I'm not very big. And when I was a little kid, I was definitely not very big. And I was the kid who could not get on the ride, okay? Because you would go to the roller coaster ride, and it would have a sign that says, you must be this tall to get on the roller coaster. And I was the kid who wasn't that tall, okay? So I appreciate that you must be this tall. The point is, you've got to have certain capabilities, certain abilities, certain innate characteristics before you're ready for microservices. You need to think about self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure. In other words, if it takes you three weeks to get a VM provisioned, you have a problem, okay? Keep that in mind. And you're probably thinking, three weeks? And my bank, it takes five weeks. I've had a lot of customers or audience members that are like, tell me, oh, it's five weeks, six weeks. One, uh, and I was actually in a federal government thing recently, and when I said that to the audience, they started laughing out loud. It was a room this size with all these people, and they said, it's six months in our organization. So if it takes a programmer an expensive resource. Many of you folks here are not free to your organization. I imagine you get good paychecks, right? As programmers, we deserve good paychecks. But if it takes three weeks to wait on an inexpensive, really cheap virtual machine, that actually sends a signal to the rest of us, doesn't it? You're going to make me, it's like waiting for a pencil so I can write. Okay? Same kind of concept. So self-service and on-demand is critical. If you can't get a new virtual machine provisioned for your needs exactly as you need it within two to five minutes, your organization has a problem at this point because this is very doable in this day and age from a technical standpoint. It's an organizational problem. It's not a technical problem. Now, you also have to think in terms of dev and ops, all right? It's no longer developers versus operators. It's no longer throw it over the wall to the operators to have to figure it out, where the developer checks it in at 4.45 p.m. on Friday. They go to the bar drinking, and the operations team figures out how to make your crappy code run all weekend by themselves. No, the developer stays all weekend if the code's that crappy, and the developer's on the pager. That's the new attitude. If the software goes down or acts up in any way, you basically are now on the pager, is my point. If you can do that, you're kind of getting in the right mindset when it comes to microservices. If you have no automation, for instance, if your operations team, your developers, whoever it might be, sets up a server by plugging it into the rack, right? One U rack mounted server, power, ping, network cable. It pixie boots, loads the operating system, and then someone SSHs in and updates the system D settings or init D, whatever you guys use for setting that server up, tweaks some stuff, start some processes, and then make sure they background uh, those guys because they step away from the terminal and they think they set up the server properly, you have a major problem. That's called a snowflake. They made a one-off. What you want is an automated baked script that basically produces that server in its pristine form every time, all the time, and that script is always checked into source control. And it really ought at this point be, should be Puppet, Chef, or Ansible. You know, Ansible Playbook will bake out that server identically every time. And actually, it should be done with your software on board, the custom software on board. So we could keep going on and on here, but these are the kind of things you should be thinking about long before you say, oh, I'm going to take my one little application and break it into 55 applications because I want to do microservices. If you can't deploy one thing easily and well on one server, how are you going to do 55 or 2,000? Okay, so just think about it as you get ready for a microservices architecture. I would recommend these books very highly. Uh, if you've not read them, you really should. Okay, I know it says ops on there. You're thinking, I'm a developer. I don't like those Linux admins. That's the wrong attitude. You've got to get kind of psyched up about your Linux admin. And more importantly, you need to learn to love your DBA. So go to your DBA, give him or her a big hug, and make sure you take them to lunch. They deserve it. Because you're probably thinking, well, it's not just the system admins, operators that bug me. It's those stupid DBAs won't change the schema. Because you're a jerk, okay? That's often what the problem is. You've got to go love them some more, and they'll change the schema when you need it to. Okay, <laughs> so just keep that in mind. All right, here's the old way of doing things. We had an operating system, a Java virtual machine. You stuck your app server on there. We put our ears, we put our wars in our ears. We stuck our wars in our war ears and jar jars, etc. We went nuts with it. Now, here's the reason why this architecture is called monolithic. This is the reason why enterprise Java is a monolithic architecture. It is because... Everyone has to agree, every person on the team has to agree to the right version of the operating system, the right version of the Java virtual machine, the right patch level of each, because there might be bugs that were fixed, the right app server, the right patch level of that too, the right configuration of that app server, and of course, all our Maven dependencies had to be the same. Now, I've seen many projects that said, oh, I got three versions of Spring. Not a good idea. I got three versions of Hibernate. Really bad idea. Okay? You don't do that sort of thing if you really want to have some control and quality about the product that you're producing. But this is why monolithic architecture is considered bad, because everyone has to agree. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried to organize like a camping trip for little kids. Like, you know, you got 10 little kids and you got like all the parents and you're going to organize something, right, at your local church or, you know, synagogue or community event. 
trying to get everyone to agree is insanely hard. And so if you have a team that looks like this, this 40-something people here that make up that application, then how do you get them to agree? It's tough. So this is where microservices comes in. You, it's about breaking up the teams so they can focus on the product they produce at, at, with the right quality and right skill set that they need. Okay? They do what they have to do. But this does mean if they build it, they own it. They are dev and ops, right? And also, they have to produce it with a great deal of automation. But we don't want to spend too much time on this because we've got to keep going. Now, these are the key microservices principles. If you want to do microservices, do think in these terms. You know, deployment independence is number one. I should be able to deploy my component at anytime I want to deploy it without disruption to any other component of the system. If I want to deploy my component five times a day, all its consumer clients have no problem with that. And you're probably thinking, how is that even possible? It's actually very possible in this new architecture. But you have to think in those kinds of terms. What if I want to deploy every day? Uh, if, in fact, this decentralized data management bugs you, everybody gets their own database, DBA won't allow for that. Again, you've got to take them to lunch. Um, think about that for a second, because there is a book that we have that helps you address that particular point. So Edson Yanago, who's here today, will be talking about this later, I believe, on the schedule. And he also has a book we've published. Let's kind of move along. All right. From a microservice pattern standpoint, you can start with the browser, the browser invoking the different servers on the server side. This is actually very common in retail. That's why I use this retail analogy here. Each of these read components on your mobile page makes a different backend service call in many cases. And so the good news is you don't have to wait. You don't block for all of the response. You asynchronously hit the pieces that you need, and you get data as the data becomes available. And it's actually OK if one of them fails. As a good example here, you can see in-store pickup says there's 15 available in my local store. What if that fails? In the case of the organization I talked to when I drew this screen with them, um, they actually have that it could fail. It's a mainframe call in that case. The mainframe holds the actual inventory in the local store. If it fails, watch what happens. Right? It just well, it just simply shows it just simply shows your store. So we don't know that 15 are available, but we do know where you're at based on your GPS location. The whole point of this is you have fallbacks in your architecture. You have default business logic that executes in the event that the network invocation fails, and you're very responsive to that. You also have the concept of the server-side gateway. You can see here we aggregate the content on the business logic on the server side, and we publish it to the client side. Again, if something fails, you catch it at the right point. You also have the ability to chain all these events together. So this is just kind of a quick introduction to microservices architecture. But again, think in terms of failure, because it will happen. If you have a distributed system and any form of network in between those components, something will fail. Something will be too slow. And this is where you put in like a circuit breaker, something like Hystrix, so you can avoid a cascading failure. So that's where the circuit breaker comes in. Again, we don't have a lot of time to spend on it here today. Now, I have a lot of demos around that specific set of topics, blue-green deployment, circuit breakers, Canary deployment, CICD, all that. There's a bunch of things you can go look at there. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because we've got more interesting things to go look at. Now, I know I'm moving fast. I appreciate that. But I really want to get to this area, right, which is the area about Vertex, the stuff that you saw earlier with the streaming data from sensors or the stuff you saw earlier with the, you know, running all those 200 requests on a single thread. This is where Vertex comes in. It is a toolkit. It is a jar file. You add it to your POM XML, and you now have this new magical superpower. Okay, it doesn't have to take over your whole environment, but it could. You can run it as a full application stack, it, just like you would have run a tr traditional Tomcat or Jetty or Netty or JBoss or WebSphere or WebLogic. This could replace that whole stack, but it doesn't have to. Okay, just keep that in mind. It is a fairly unopinionated toolkit. You do with it as you will. Think of it as like the Swiss Army knife of awesomeness that you can do whatever you like with. You can build a house. You can, you know build a furniture out of it if you wanted to. Now, at the very base level, we have this concept of the Vertex core. It speaks HTTP 1 and 2 by default. And actually, the, what you saw earlier with the router, that's just HTTP, right? It's doing get, put, post, delete, standard stuff. It also speaks UDP. It speaks TCP. That means you can map anything you want to over it, including sensor data. Anything you can, that can speak to a network can talk to this thing. And you are responsible in some cases for the protocol. There's lots of protocols out of the box, AMQP, HTTP, UDP, right? HTTP, right? There's just a lot of them. Just keep that in mind, that you can do what you will with it. People use all this in very creative ways because it's just a network listener, an async network listener. There's two key components to the core. The event bus we're going to spend a lot of time on today, or a little bit of time when we get into it, and shared data. The event bus is simply nothing more than all JVMs can see each other in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Each JVM on the cluster will basically see each other from a TCP standpoint. People always ask, well, how does it, how does it talk A to B? It's TCP. You know, that whole networking thing we've been doing for so long? 
you know, uh, transport control protocol, they invented when we invented the internet, that stuff, it works really well. Okay, if you guys have been using the internet a while, you're probably pretty comfortable with it. So we use TCP for in, a, uh, in between JVM connectivity, and then we can also do shared data, mapped to something like a Hazelcast or InfiniSpan or something like that. You can do web-based templating. So if you want any kind of traditional web app, you've got templating mechanisms here. You can also do OAuth and things of that nature. There's the router you saw earlier. You can have any form of cluster management. Maybe you want Zookeeper or Hazelcast. We also have InfiniSpan. You can integrate with things like Stomp, AMQP, you know, RabbitMQ. You can also do, use multiple programming languages, Groovy, JavaScript, Java, Groovy, all right, yeah, Ruby. Go crazy there. There's asynchronous database driver, microservices architecture in the form of service discovery and circuit breakers, and bridges. We'll show you the bridge because it's super awesome. And of course, metric capture. So it, is, it does give you everything you need to build full apps, right? Like you would have done with WebLogic or WebSphere. The difference is it does everything async in a reactive way. So let's keep marching along here. Okay, this is the vertical. This is the program, right? You write a program, we call it a vertical. You can think of it as your class, your, your class file, right? Your .java file, your .ruby file, your .js file. It's just your program. And then you would basically run that inside a Java virtual machine. And you can have many programs running in a single JVM. Uh, and all of them speak the event bus to each other, okay? So keep in mind, it's a single threaded architecture. It is based on the concept of the event loop. The event loop basically says, as a request comes in, I will find an appropriate handler to pass it off to, and I'll go to handle the next request, and the next request, and the next request. So that's, it's never blocked, okay? If you do block it, if you do do something that causes a block, it, you'll get uh, stack traces showing up on our console. We'll say, sorry, you're blocking the event loop, stop. Because it is easy to block the event loop by accident. You're like, oh, I'll just connect to the database and run a big query that takes two minutes to respond. At about one second into that, it'll get start th storing exceptions back to you. you. You're blocking, you're blocking, stop. If you must do a two-minute query against the database, there's actually a super easy way to handle that, okay? <laughs> Just if you want to know. Uh, you can pass it off to a worker pool, uh, but we don't have to worry about that right now. So it's super easy to background anything you need to that just takes too long, okay? Now, we do set up an event loop per core. So in this case, it's, you know, if you have four cores visible to the JVM, it does set up four event loops. So you might have four threads. And technically, there is one background thread, too, so it's eight. But just think in terms of a single thread that you're never going to block. You're always going to dispatch events to some form of handler. OK. Like, here's a simple, super simple example of that, right? Here's Hello World. I'm going to create an HTTP server. I'm going to have a request handler. That request, this is a lambda, right, is going to then map here. And I'm going to say, request, give me your response. And then I'm going to end the response. You can also chunk. You can go crazy with stream-based chunking. End it with Hello Vertex. And then the last thing I do is listen on 8080. So this is the kind of expressive API you'll start to deal with. And this is a super simple, no URL distinction. Any traffic coming over 8080 goes to this one endpoint and actually responds. OK? Now, if you need to get started, you can use, you know, there's the getting started technique here. There's even a Maven plugin to actually produce a template project for you. And then you can do Maven compile vertex run. This would allow you to actually uh, do interactive development. And I'll show you a quick example of that. OK? And then, of course, you can set up your routes. You can see the router here if on root, on get, router.get. This is the method we'll call with the uh, method reference here. Also, if I have parameters, it works this way. You can see here's our two methods, or our method with the parameter. OK. Web apps handled accordingly, if you want to do web apps, but it's all done async, no blocking. And we've seen an example of that. Here's a more complicated example. You can see I have get, put, or sorry, get, post, and delete, and put. So you, full CRUD operations, traditional REST programming model, but you know, it's just set up differently. And then the event bus does, goes from JVM to JVM. Let's kind of show you this now. And you guys brought your phones, right? Smartphones? We're going to need those. Please get those ready. All right, so let me jump in here, and I'll show you something. You can actually go to web.bur.red right now. I'm SSHing into a, an image. And if our network holds up, all right, we should be good. Uh, if you go to right here, let's just run this real quick. Pseudo uh, Java. No, no, no. Uh, vertex. Type bur. <laughs> this is where I have not had enough sleep. All right, I'm, gonna bring up, I'm bringing up the web server now. There we go. The web server's up. OK, let's go to our browser. And we're going to go to web.bur.red. And there's its response. It's a simple little piece of just a chunk of text. OK, so web.bur.red is the URL. I promise you this is going to get more interesting. You're going to want to get out your phone. So just keep that in mind. All right, so I can go to the endpoint. It says hello to. OK, so that's my application. It's really simple. Hello and your name. You can, and you can see hello and your name right there. 
All right, web.bird.red. Let's go change our code. VI main here, and we'll go to, it says hello too, right? Let's find that. Uh, there it is. Let's actually make this bonjour. How about that? All right, let's run it again. You notice I didn't compile anything. I just reran it. And actually, it'll dynamically pick that up if I chose to. And there we go. So I just, in production, edited the code and redeployed it for you guys on your phone right now. Now, this is the kind of mental model you should be in. The development cycle is super fast. And some of you are probably thinking, wait a second. All those cool kids at the office who do Node.js, this is how they work. Exactly. Okay, that was the point of all this. Basically, Tim Fox, when he invented this technology, he saw what was happening in the Node.js universe and the architecture and the style of development they were using, which was edit, refresh, edit, refresh, edit, refresh. And, he, and, and of course, this Java people were like, oh, build in our clips or IDE, and we, let's go get coffee. It's building, okay? And then you come back and you're like, oh, crap, I didn't have the logic right. <laughs> Fix the code, build, go get another cup of coffee. Now, at this point, you've had four cups of coffee in the same five-minute window, right? So you're talking to your friends. You're, you know, the build takes minutes, if not weeks, depending on where you come from. So this is a different model. And you can kind of see it works like the Node.js universe does, but... Again, let's get more interesting. Let's actually show you something more interesting here. I'm going to go into this uh, Vertex event bus example. So that was a simple web server. Let's show you a more advanced web server. OK. Yeah, all right. I'm bringing up another web server right now. Let's go back to web.bird.red. And there we go. There it is. This is what it does now. So in this case, I'm pushing messages to you from the server. All right. So if you guys get connected there, you'll get server messages also. And I'm going to bring up another window now. Because, so go to web.bird.red, and I'm going to basically add in, let's add in Java messages to that mix. So you're going to see server messages and Java messages. And let's add in, dun, 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 dun. let's go, let's add Ruby messages to that mix. Okay, I can even go back to the server. Oh, oh this is a different server. Let's close this one. SH web.bird.red. Uh, okay, you guys should get Ruby. Java messages is now streaming into your phone. If I come over now, and so I can actually add another consumer on the server side. So let's actually add a JavaScript consumer. Just I'm picking random ones here. So basically, I have th three producers on the server side, one consumer on the server side, and then, of course, everyone here in the room who's using their phone right now is also consuming on the client side. Now, you're probably thinking, I could do this with Java E. Yes, you can, all right? But let's kind of show you what the code looks like. All right, so that's cruising away there. The, let's look at the code real quick. Where did I leave it? I have tons of examples we could spend a lot of time on, what Arcs, Java, and things like that. But, okay, here we go. Here's the web server. It's like the web server you saw earlier, right? Create HTTP server. The difference is we have this thing called the bridge options, and we have an outbound permitted channel we call my feed. That basically means outbound, kind of like a firewall. This particular set of network messages are allowed out the firewall to whomever is on that bridge. Bridge can go directly to the browser, as it does in this case, or maybe a Node.js application or some other system. And it's just a direct in-memory feed. There's no guaranteed delivery, meaning guaranteed delivery, by the way, if someone always asks that, means you write it to disk. That's how you guarantee that someone will actually see that message, right? You write it to disk, and eventually you take it off the disk kind of thing. In this case, it's purely in-memory. We're streaming the data out. Uh, and you can see it's all that amount of code. That's it. You can see right here we have the uh, set periodic. So this is the server message, eventbus.publish right there. That's what's going on. If I come over here and look at my Java publisher, eventbus.publish right there. If I look at my consumer, it's a handler against that same feed, my feed right there. If I look at the Groovy version, the Groovy version, again, consumer, eventbus consumer. If I look at the uh, Ruby publisher over here, here's what the Ruby one looks like. Okay, you can see event bus publish. So it's publish, handler, publish, handler. That's all it is. Right? That's how you set it up. So that right there means you guys are getting messages from me. Okay? But let's go ahead and kill that. We, we got even more interesting things to show you. Is that interesting at all yet? Okay, you can say, no, nah, that's boring. Fine. We're going to take it up a notch. All right? I'm going to shut these serv services down real quick. And as I drop them, you're going to see your messages are changing too. Okay? Server, server, server. I just killed those processes. And, and actually, let's go and take the server down. So I am, you can see also those socket connects. Those are all the people who connected for me. So what, 20 of you guys connected? Let's see if we can get all of you guys to connect on your phone. Um, all right, so ps dash e. Let's see what I have running here. Uh, I want to see if I have, oh, these other Java processes are running. Let's see. Uh, dun, dun, dun. This is such a slow server. Oh, at this point, now the, the server's probably dropped. Da, 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 da. 
All right. This is actually live. Okay, good. We're back to good again. Okay, let's go here. Let me show you this example. So I showed you how to just run things just at source, and we dynamically compile it and run it, just like you would if you're a Ruby person, Groovy person, or Java person, dynam treat it like a dynamic language. However, you can build a fat jar. You can do it the traditional Maven way if you want, and that's what I did with this particular jar file right here. Uh, you can see this jar file. This is a fat jar. There's the size of it right there, and that includes everything I need in a self-contained jar, and I can say sudo, sudo, Java dash jar, and then let's name it the jar file. Now, this one is a slightly more interesting one. You guys can connect to web.bird.red now. Okay, so look, already someone connected. All right, now you're probably thinking, what is that? Just do some little finger painting for me. Okay, it's a finger painting game. Let me bring up the dashboard. All right, try, not, try to keep it clean now. There we go. All right. Let's see, I can draw a big B there. And each stroke that you lay down, okay, shows up in our dashboard here. So if I add some colors, and I can make it black, you know, whatever you want to draw, each stroke that you identify, right, each stroke you put in actually shows up here in real time. So <laughs> the, it's a super simple little uh, application. I'll, here, I'll show you the code with it. I, I like the face, by the way. Someone did a good job there. Oh, they just erased it. So if you hit clear, right, your, your thing goes away. Um, now, so let's go look at this code real quickly, because I think this is a super important concept here. And that is, let's look at the server side. So the server side is just slightly more complicated than what you saw earlier. I do inbound and outbound. I come in from you and out to my dashboard. I'm literally taking the serialized canvas object that you're producing and pushing it out to the dashboard, all just right to the event bus. From your phone or your 3G connection or 4G connection, out to my EC2 server, which is actually running in Virginia in this case, this is a Virginia-based server, you know, to the, over this conference Wi-Fi to this laptop right now. And so just think about what, that what you have to do to make stuff like that work in a traditional get, put, post, crud world. You probably are thinking, I can't even do that. That's kind of the point. And it takes almost no code, okay? The real code here is specifically in the area of the client. If I look at my ugly HTML and JavaScript, I specifically have something called the end stroke. So when you pick your finger up, that's the end stroke event. It says send the canvas. This canvas does nothing more than serialize, right, uh, to data right there. It serializes that canvas and publishes it. So the client browser side of this does the consumer and publisher on the event bus just like all the server side stuff does too. It's that hard. So this is actually where all the logic is, is actually in this client. You can see it's just really ugly here because <laughs> I'm not a particularly good JavaScript programmer. But the result is something of this nature. Okay? So keep that in mind. All right? Well, you guys can feel free to keep painting. We'll leave that alone for a moment. But let's jump back into slideware mode for just a second. And I have a couple more things to show you. Uh, we mentioned RxJava. Whoop. There it here. I want to. I mentioned RxJava because RxJava is one of the server-side programming models you can take advantage of. Let me see if I can show you that. Uh, well, let's show you a base-level RxJava example, just kind of get a, a feel for it. Here's a good example. Okay. So RxJava is the concept of data is always streaming. That's why I showed you the sensor demo earlier. The data is always streaming. It's not a simple standalone event, nor is it thread-based. Right. It's there's data coming in all the time, and I'm going to receive data on stream one, stream two, stream three, and in this case, we're going to aggregate the data. We're basically going to see that 10 plus 100 plus 20 is 130. And we're going to return that as an aggregate response. Now, this is an RxJava programming model based on the observable. It, it takes a while to get your head around it, but it's incredibly powerful because you don't have to block. Now, all of this is lazy evaluation until you hit the subscribe method. The subscribe method has three main methods that are callbacks. One is the data. Here's the data. Here's the data. Here's the data. The other is, oh, there was an error. There's a throwable. And the other is, we're done. We're completed. You get three main messages coming back to the API. If I come over here and uh, doo -doo -doo, let's actually do this. Let's just go ahead and run it. Okay, you can see right there it comes back with 130, 150, 170, and completed. It just rips through the stream. Now, to make this point a little bit more interesting, let's show you one that actually does something that you might have to do in an enterprise setting. And again, all these are available to you online. We showed you the paint one example. Let's show you this one. All right. This is where it gets interesting, because this is a common enterprise kind of problem. I have an API that I'm providing to my mobile client, my business-to-business -business partner, my whatever. It's an API I have to produce. And I need to produce that API, but I have to consume three, four, five other APIs. 
And this is where this technology came from. This RX Java was built by the folks at Netflix because they have front-end edge services where your device connects to, and they have to then call 5, 10, 20 other services to fulfill the request. And so you want to do all that async non-blocking, and you also want to do it in a nice programming model, in this case, the RX Java programming model. So here's the this is my original client-side request. So there's a, there's a server request, or a browser request, comes into the server. It then goes to GitHub and says, GitHub, give me all your users. Then, based on each user, get the user's details. And also get all the user's followers. So based on stream one, grab the data as an event, go get more data, right? Based on stream two, get the data as an event, go get more data. All this is done asynchron asynchronously in a non-blocking way. So this means I can now have a composite zipped up answer for my user and a nice clean set of JSON based on what I want to program. So this is a very common use case if you produce services at the edge. Uh, and actually, let's go, let's go here. I lost this terminal window. Okay, And uh, this is the composite one. Let's see if I can make it run real fast. Did I produce a fat jar? I did. Okay. Uh, dun, 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 target. And 08. Okay. Will it bring it up? All right. There it is. It's up. And then let me go to my browser. Okay. I'm just going to localhost 8080. And if the network is fast enough for me, uh, there it goes. It's trying. There. It went out and grabbed all that data and aggregated it into one single response for me. Again, it doesn't take a lot of code to do something pretty interesting. And all this is async non-blocking. Because if you're doing an edge service which has a million mobile devices hitting it, we don't want to be a, uh, synchronous blocking. right? You want to be async non-blocking. So that's a really good use case and where RxJava really, really shines with this kind of programming model. You can see it's fairly readable. Do this, do this, do this. And it all handles that accordingly. Okay? I say that and make that point because if you typically do async reactor programming, it doesn't look like this. Okay, it actually winds itself way down a crazy list of callback, right, callbacks, which means callback hell is what you get yourself into. In this case, it nicely stacks up, so you can see it. Now, let's show you one more critical example what, uh, while we're here. Let's make sure we cover the key things in the slides. You guys are doing a good job with this, okay? Good stuff there. Um, let's go back here. Oh, different thing here. Oh, we're running out of time. Well, okay, let's just show you this then. All right. Go to a different URL for me. Go to game.bird.red. Game.bird.red. Okay? Hopefully, you all have your phone out because this is going to be interesting. Game.bird.red. If you get connected, uh, might, you might have to refresh because depending on the network performance, sometimes you have to refresh. Okay? Uh, go. Oh, this thing is running slow right here. Let me refresh here. Dun, 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 dun. Go. There we go. Okay, so that one had timed out on me. This is what you're going to get on your phone, the balloons, okay? The reason this is important is everything that you're doing is a transaction through my back-end architecture. So from your phone at 60 frames per second, we're animating these little balloons. You pop a balloon, it goes back in through a transaction, in this case to a Frankfurt server running in Germany, and then through a series of steps, and then it comes out on my dashboard. So you're, if you're popping balloons, let's, let's see what you guys are doing there. Uh, so game .bird red. Here's my leaderboard. All right, look, wow, you guys are already jamming in. Uh, someone's already got 60 points, okay? Uh, now, let's go here. Let's bring this other one up. So it's literally going to from your phone to a Frankfurt server on EC2, and then it's driving my dashboards. Now, wow, you, uh, you already have uh, 1,600 transactions in the system, 1,700 transactions in the system. Every pop is a transaction. There are 51 people playing right now on their phones. So this is actually is a real-time, oh, someone just get disconnected. So, so, you know, depending on your 3G connection, right, you might get connected, disconnected, see, that kind of thing. Uh, now, well, we need to explain this architecturally speaking, so let's hold on a second. Okay, I paused you, all right? It's important we talk about this for a second, because I don't want you guys thinking, oh, that's awesome, but you've got to understand. All right, let's go back over here. Is, is this the, the web page? No, I gotta, let me find the right page. Uh, scoreboard, logo host, 88. All right. Oh, Jesus. So I can't even find my slides, but I have the URL, okay? Oh, is it going to load? I'm going to just show you one thing real quick. I'll let you play some more, but hold on. Uh, right here. This is what that, why this is important. Every pop you make, 
okay? It's going through a single JVM, single threaded JVM on the server side. Every pop you make, all those transactions are flying in. It then in turn calls yet another microservice to basically do a calculation of what, what are the achievement levels again. Then it calls a traditional Java E application. This is running on traditional JBoss in this case, traditional Java application, asynchronously in, invocated, to run a spreadsheet called Drools has a concept of a decision table, so where the business analysts can lay out a spreadsheet for business rules. It's running the spreadsheet on a traditional Java E application. This is fully synchronous in the traditional Java E way, but it doesn't matter, right? It's all done asynchronously at this level. This is the front end edge service that's actually hitting all those guys. When he gets the data back asynchronously, he updates his scoreboards. So all the traffic is going through a single JVM running in Frankfurt right now, okay? But it gets more interesting. All right, we're not done yet. Let's go back into it. You guys are playing again, okay? There we go. Let's bring up our leaderboard one more time, scoreboard. All right, there are 50 of you connected right now, 3,000 uh, 3, pops. All right, but let's make this game a little bit harder. All right, all right, let's make it a little bit harder. Make the balloons nearly invisible and make them a little faster. Is that cool? We got a little faster, makes it harder? All right, I'll, I'll make it easier on you. Let's make them a little fatter and slower and more visible, make them nice and bright. And actually, we'll make the red balloons 10 points. And I'll change the background color to green and make it a little bit more interesting for you. Okay? So keep in mind, I am literally making pushes to your phone by changing everything is interacting with that single instance on my Frankfurt server right now. And you guys are all hammering the heck out of it. Okay? Uh, already we're at... 8,000, 9,000 transactions into the system. Just in a few minutes, we'll be playing together. But it gets a little bit more interesting. The team actually, when, who helped me build this, they're like, okay, let's add some more sizzle to this. Uh, all right, right there. Okay, and then actually, I can change the point totals, too, to really make it interesting. Let's make actually red balloons 100 points. Uh, okay, and update. There we go. All right, and I, if I want to, I can pause you again. Okay, so I know we got to wrap it up. One more second, and then you ready? Three, two, one, game over. All right, but we got, we got 55 people at the high end. We got 1, 000, 1, 000, uh, 16,000 transactions to the system. And again, uh, you can see who here ended up on the top tier, right? Uh, we generate your names dyna uh, dynamically because we learned if people put in their real name. There's a lot of people with some really bad names. I can't believe their parents named them that, if you know what I mean. All right, so we generate the names. But, so you can see all these updates in real time. Now, hopefully this helps you understand that you can do a lot with a single JVM on a single thread, okay? Because if it's all done asynchronously and the programming model makes sense, you can kind of fundamentally change the way you build applications going forward. Now, I'm not saying the average business application needs this kind of interactivity, but what if you did have this for your users, for whatever application you're creating? This kind of design, this kind of aesthetic, this kind of responsiveness. I think it changes the game for everybody. All right, let's go. We'll walk back here because we're out of time. But just keep in mind the balloon. Someone always asks, "Can I get all the balloon game?" Absolutely, it's all open source. There's the repos if you want it. And keep in mind this whole slide deck is available to you at Bitly Reactive MSA. Do we have any time for questions, or are we out? We have about five minutes for a qu any questions at all. Any thoughts? Random. Was this cool? Okay. Any question? You're guys thinking, I don't want to, I want to pop balloons. I know. <laughs> yeah? Um, any random thought about this? So, yes, sir. Yeah, you could use UDP also. Uh, TCP is a little easier to deal with, especially in a cloud-based architecture where UDP is blocked. All right, so UDP by default is blocked on off, uh, most infrastructure as a service clouds, so TCP is often a better choice. That's all. And with TCP, by the way, you can also introduce back pressure. Which is, uh, we didn't talk about back pressure, but you often think about that in a reactive system. That's the ability for the producer to get a signal from the subscriber to say, hey, could you slow up a little bit? You're, you're jamming too many messages my way. That's a more advanced topic, but it is something very, very doable in a TCP world. Okay, any other questions? All right, yes, sir. Yes, yeah, the, the game doesn't really have much, but it's all exposed through via JMX. And if we look back over here, you have, you have JMX available to you, and then you can use Drop Wizard and Hocular to also do like um, higher level metric capture and um, 
you know, look at that. So yes, just like any standard enterprise Java thing, it has to have some form of metric capture, logging, all those traditional things. So people are running this in production already for all sorts of interesting use cases. Again, you got to think in terms of edge services, right? Services closer to that million mobile phone user or business of business API or something like that. And I need to have async aggregation of the other server side APIs and you want to run at high volume, okay? There's people who really run millions of transactions through this thing. All right, well, I think we're out of time, but if you have questions for me, I'm available for the remaining, you know, several hours here today. Please do come up and talk to me. I did bring stickers for Vertex and Fabric 8. I didn't show you too much Fabric 8 stuff. Fabric 8 also gives you some nice CI CD capabilities and a nice Maven plugin to help you work iteratively on these kinds of projects. But that hopefully gives you guys a little bit of a taste of what we're doing here with Vertex. And please go check it out. And don't forget the free book on our website. And don't forget the web, you know, again, the slides are all available to you here. All right, thank you very much.